DHH. Hello everyone. My name is Ellie DeLeon. Um, so today we'll be doing a pre-recording of the training that we delivered on the new BD preset 3 mil blood gas syringe. So I'm also joined here with one of your team members, Amy Sullivan from your point of care um, team. So before we begin, please scan the QR code and register your attendance and this record will appear on my health learning record. And if it doesn't work, don't worry, um, you can text your name and staff link number and the facility and your facility on the number that you see on the screen and Amy will register this for you. So before we begin, I'd like to do acknowledgement of country. New South Wales Health Pathology acknowledges the traditional custodians of the lands on which we work and pay our respects to ancestors and elders, past, present and emerging. We are committed to honouring Australian Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people's unique cultural and spiritual relationships to the land, waters and seas and their rich contribution to society. I welcome you today. I'm sitting on Daru country and Amy, where are you from? I'm sitting on Wiradjuri country today. Wonderful. So as you're aware, all your facilities now will have the BD 3 mil preset blood gas syringe. Um, any leftover old syringes that you use for point of care testing, your coordinators will come to your facilities and take them away. We want you to start using the syringes right now. You also have, should have received an instructions for use flyer that you see on the screen. If you don't have it, don't worry. It is also available to you on your intranet or internet site under New South Wales Health Pathology, point of care, testing in education and training. At the end of this session, we'll go through how you would access that page. So when you get the syringe out of its packaging, it comes in a sterile packet and inside will contain a heparinized 3 mil syringe. It has a green plunger to indicate that it is heparin and it doesn't look like a, uh, a normal syringe. It contains heparin inside and also included is a green hemoguard cap. So once you attain the sample, the cap goes on to prevent any air or oxygen going into the sample. So before we begin, most clinicians will be collecting a venous sample. So either you'll be collecting from a freshly inserted cannula versus a butterfly collection attached to a syringe on the end from a venous sample. And if this is the case, we want you to push the plunger all the way to the end because we don't want you to um, it, you know, draw excess air into the sample if you don't need to. If you were doing an arterial sample, which is very rare, but some of you may have access to arterial lines, or you may end up doing a true arterial stab where you would put a hypodermic syringe onto the end, um, syringe and needle, I mean, needle on the end and do a direct arterial stab. If this is the case, we ask that you pull the plunger back to the 1.6 mil. And I'll go through the significance of the 1.6 mil in a moment. So as you, as the arterial blood comes up into the syringe, as it automatically fills due to the arterial pressure, the air and the oxygen will escape through the semi-permeable plug. And once the blood comes in contact with the semi-permeable plug, it snaps the pores shut, and that's just an added extra feature in the, in the new point-of-care syringes. So once you've prepped the syringe and you're ready to fill the syringe, as I mentioned, you must fill only 1.6 mil of blood at the end because if you don't get the correct blood to heparin ratio, what will happen is that the results will become erroneous or inaccurate. So it's vitally important that you only give at the end result is a 1.6 mil. Say, for example, if you're drawing from a cannula, aspirate until the plunger hits the 1.6 or versus a butterfly collection because we have to accommodate for the air excess air in that tubing that air in the tubing is equivalent to half a mil of air or dead space so it will it will basically you know accommodate for half a mil of air so what we want you to do is to pull the plunger back to roughly about 2.1 mils 
And then when you disconnect, dispose of the sharps in the sharps bin, when you expel all the air out, you'll be left with about approximately 1.6 mil of blood. So again, just to reassure you need to have the correct blood to additive ratio and it's equivalent to the 1.6 mil. So as I mentioned, you must remove all the air because if you mix air in with the sample, again, that will make the results erroneous. So once you expel the air, pop your cap on. Once the cap's on nice and tight, um, you will start to roll in the palm of your hands for 10 seconds. And once you've done that, and then you need to invert another 10 times. So this is the reason because the syringe is coated, spray coated with dry balanced calcium heparin and you need to coat all the red blood cells with all the heparin and you need to do this immediately to prevent any microclots from forming because if you have microclots in your sample it can really really interfere with your troponin level. So the facility want you to mix immediately once you get the blood into the syringe and then you need to mix it again prior to you doing any of the testing on the cartridges or the instruments. So you're walking over to the to the um, instruments where you do your first test, which is your CG4, which is your blue cartridge. So basically mix again, okay? So the 10 rolls and then the 10 inversions, remove the cap and the facility want you to expel two drops of blood because we don't want any chance of any air bubbles being in the sample that can make the results erroneous. So either do that, you know, expel two drops on a clean gauze pad or a paper towel, whatever you've got handy beside you. So once you've done that, you can pop pop it onto um, your your ISAT machine and follow them from your ISAT, then your Keme, and then your troponin. Some people tell me that um, there may be a delay in the time that they do their first test and then the troponin may be up to about 20 minutes, you know, lag time. If that's the case, we want you to mix the sample up again because what happens is there's hemo concentration has occurred in the syringe just to mix it again for the 10 rolls and then the 10 inversions before you do it again because otherwise if you don't, the results will become erroneous. So let's look at some of the pre-analytical errors that can occur in the point of care space. So about 70% of the clinical decisions from your doctors that give a diagnosis, those decisions are based on the information derived from the test results that are attained from your point of care testing analyzers or from when you send the blood tubes into the lab. But however, up to 70% of those diagnostic errors occur in the pre-analytical space. So what, I, what do I mean by the pre-analytical space? So when we look at the total testing phase of blood, it can be divided into three areas, pre-analytical, analytical and post-analytical. So the pre-analytical phase or pre-analytical space is when us clinicians, whether it be doctors, nurses, phlebotomists, whoever's collecting the blood, what happens is how do we get the blood into the syringe or the blood tube? And these include everything from identification to, you know, what choosing what gauge you're going to use, you know, alcohol cleansing, tourniquet time, following the order of draw, mixing, etc., etc. So it is, a, is how we get the blood in the syringe and before you pop the first drops on the analyzer, okay? So that's a pre-analytical space. The analytical um, phase is when you first punch the ID, patient ID, into the instrument and pop the first drops on the cartridges or when the, the blood tube hits specimen reception and they punch the information into the computer system and send the, the specimen off to the lab. Normally it's the instrument that analyzes the blood to give you the test results. So that's the analytical phase. And the post-analytical phase is what do we do with those results and how do we store the specimen? But as you can see, 70% of all the diagnostic errors occur in the pre-analytical space. So that means what, how are we, what or what are we doing to affect the sample um, at the beginning before we do the test? So let's have a look at some of these common pre-analytical errors that can occur in the point of care space. So the first one is sample misidentification. 
So that's the number one error worldwide. If we get the wrong information in the wrong tube, it means wrong diagnosis. Wrong diagnosis means wrong treatment, and wrong treatment potentially has adverse events, and it can lead to death. Your policy stipulates that we must use three patient identifiers, and we must identify the patient three times. And this includes first name, last name, date of birth, and if they're an inpatient, they must have an armband on. It's illegal to collect blood if they don't have an armband on. And then you check first name, last name, date of birth, and you ensure that the medical record number matches what is on the ID label. You always must label the syringe or the blood tube after you've collected the blood, and then always enter the patient ID into the analyzer before you do any testing. There has been situations where clinicians have told me that they forgot to put a label on the syringe and they've gone ahead and done their first test on the iStat machine, popped the syringe down, walked away. When they've come back, OMG, they find a second syringe on the bench. And again, that one is not labeled. In that situation, you can see how sample misidentification can occur. I mean, it is rare, but I have heard that it does happen, and we just need to be diligent in regards to popping a label on the, on the syringe. The second one is sample dilution. So again, your policy and your procedures allow you to collect blood from anything called a central venous access device. So these include your central lines, your pick lines, your porta caps, your vas caps, and even your art lines. And in that situation, the facility recommend that you discard at least three times the dead space when you're sampling from these catheters. Otherwise, the results will become erroneous due to sample dilution because you could have sometimes have normal saline or whatever IV fluids you've got going sitting in the line or any type of IV medication as well sitting in the line. And if some of that dilution comes in into the syringe, what happens, the results will become erroneous. So majority of you will probably end up collecting blood from a freshly inserted cannula. So across the New South Wales healthcare facilities, they stipulate that you're only allowed to collect blood from a freshly inserted cannula. Once you've flushed it, given IV medications through it or connecting up to an IV drip, we are no longer allowed to access our IV cannulas because um, too many um, catheter-related bloodstream infections have occurred within New South Wales and we're trying to, um, you know, get that rate down. So please, please uh, follow your policy and procedures. But sample dilution will cause a decrease in your CO2, your oxygen, your sodium, your potassium, your calcium, your chloride, and increase your HB, glucose, and your lactate. Number three, incorrect blood heparin ratio due to insufficient sample volume. So again, this is where I was talking about is that you need to get the correct blood to heparin ratio because the International Federation of Clinical Chemists recommends a final concentration, a heparin concentration of 50 international units per mil of blood should be in all blood gas syringes. So within, with our blood gas syringes, the required amount of blood that you need is 1.6 mil. So versus your old syringes was 1.5. So again, it's really, really important that you collect no more and no less than the 1.6 because if you do, it can cause erroneous results. Air bubbles in the sample, as I mentioned to you before, we must expel any air bubbles that's trapped in the sample before you mix, because if you mix the sample with the air bubbles inside, it can lead to erroneous results that can increase your pH and your oxygen and can decrease your carbon dioxide. So your facility recommend that you must expel two drops of blood either onto a clean gauze pad or a paper towel, whatever you have handy beside you, before you put your first drops on, on your first cartridge. Sample clotting, number four. So with your sample clotting, and if you get any microclots in the sample, what happens is your results will be erroneous as well. And this is really true for your troponin level because your troponin really is affected if there's any microclots present in the sample. So to prevent the sample from clotting, because as I mentioned, in the syringe we have a dry 
um, uh, spray coated dry balance heparin, calcium heparin inside the syringe and you need to mix the sample up immediately because you need to coat all the red blood cells with the with the heparin to prevent any microclots from occurring. So your facility want you to roll it in the palm of your hands for 10 seconds. Once you've done that, and then they want you to invert for another 10. And you can do this by either drawing the number eight in the air or doing a figure of eight, but making sure that you flick that wrist and flick that wrist. So again, as I said, this will prevent the sample from um, having any microclots because sometimes if you have any microclots in the sample and you end up running the test on the analyzers or the instrument, it can actually clog up the probes in the instrument and sometimes your point of care coordinators won't come out to you to fix it until a couple of days. So therefore your instrument is down and you don't have any um, instruments to analyze the blood for your patient when they're coming to your facility. So hemolysis, what is hemolysis? So it's really, really important that um, Hemolysis is basically a cause of a rupture of your red blood cells. So what's the function of a red blood cell? A red blood cell carries oxygenated blood to all the cells in your body. And in a tiny red blood cell contain thousands and thousands of molecules of hemoglobin because we need the hemoglobin molecule to attach to oxygen to carry the, the oxygenated blood around to your body. So what happens in the red blood cell when it ruptures it's the intracellular contents inside a cell that leaks out into the plasma or the serum. And therefore, because potassium is predominantly higher inside a cell than it is on the outside, you get an elevated serum potassium. Due to the dilution, what happens is you can get a decrease in your sodium and your calcium. So sometimes it's really important to avoid hemolysis. So some of the things that we may do to cause hemolysis, remember your tourniquet, 60 second rule, you need to ensure that the tourniquet is released within 60 seconds. If you don't, you cause hemoconcentration of blood in the patient's arm and you can hemolyze a few thousand red blood cells. Don't ever, ever slap the vein or flick or even tell the pump patient to do a fist pump because if you do those two techniques, what happens, you end up smashing another few thousand red blood cells, or blood cells as well. Never, ever shake the tubes or the syringe too rigorously because if you do the shaking, the cha-cha-cha-cha-cha, what can happen? You can also hemolyze a few thousand red blood cells. And another big culprit is your prep that you use to clean the site or your bung. So depending on where, which one it is, whether it's a 70% alcohol versus a 2% chlorhexidine combined with the 70% alcohol, it doesn't matter which prep that you use, the key is to let it dry. Because if you don't let the alcohol dry and if the alcohol comes contaminated with the tip of the blood collection needle or the tip of the cannula on the insertion or the, um, the cleansing of the, the bung on the end before you connect the syringe on, if the alcohol is still wet, you're going to burst another 10,000 red blood cells. Remember, one tiny drop of blood contains 10,000 red blood cells. So ensure that you prevent hemolysis. Another thing as well is that if you have a difficult collection and it's really, really, really hard to get the blood, I ask that you don't persevere to get the blood because if you try and persevere, the sample will be hemolyzed because what's happening is that as you pull back on the plunger, you're causing reflux at the tip of the cannula sheath or at the tip of the blood collection needle. And what happens is that reflux causes the red cells to go in and out, in and out, in and out, and it causes shearing along the way. So again, we ask that if you... Um, don't persist with a difficult collection and start all over again. Another point that I missed before as well is that sometimes to prevent microclots from happening. Some clinicians tell me that if you are one of these clinicians, I'd advocate that like you normally would collect blood into a 10 mil syringe and then you use a hypodermic needle and then squirt the blood into a normal point of care syringe. Please, if you're one of those clinicians, I advocate that you don't do this. The reason why that is, is that your syringes are not coated with surfactant or lubrication and it doesn't have any heparin inside. So it only takes 10 seconds for the microclots to occur. And remember, a microclot will interfere with your troponin level and make results erroneous. So after 60 seconds, 
also what happens is that the red cells stick to the side of the internal diameter of the syringe because there's no lubrication on there. And so when you pop the hypodermic needle onto the end and squirt the blood in, as the plunger moves down the internal diameter of the syringe, you burst another few thousand red blood cells. And also squirting the blood through a normal hypodermic needle is only meant for drawing up medication or uh, given an injection that was never made for uh, collecting um, blood because inside a, a needle, a hypodermic needle, it has fine nicks and burrs and as the red cells come past through that, you've smashed another few thousand red blood cells. So this is why we prefer you not to do that collection technique where possible. Always collect the sample straight away into a point of care syringe, either that or using a safety butterfly directly um, collecting the blood from the end there straight into the syringe to prevent any microclots forming. So that's it uh, from me in a nutshell. I'm going to pass it over to you now to Amy and normally we show a short video at the end of this but you can access this now on your internet site and Amy will go through the steps on how to do that to access the information. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Ellie. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so those of you who might not be aware, New South Wales Health Pathology does have an internet and an intranet page. They pretty much mirror each other. I am going to show you how to find our services on the internet page today just because sometimes if you want to access this information outside of work you might not be able to access the intranet version but like I said they do mirror each other. So this is what our New South Wales Health Pathology internet page looks like. You're going to want to go to pathology.health.newsouthwales.gov.au and you'll come to this screen. From there, I just want you to go down to clinical services. You're going to scroll down and you will see point of care testing. Once you get to there, come across, go to education and training, click this one, and you'll come to a whole page of uh, education and training related uh, resources for point of care. And we, we do add more stuff every day. You'll scroll down, you won't get too far down the page and you're going to see the BD 3 mil preset blood gas syringe rollout resources. This is where you will find the video that Ellie mentioned. It goes for about four minutes and it just runs you through the basics of this syringe um, and the important tips you need to take away from the session with Ellie today. And we also touch on how to collect a quality sample via um, your invasive lines, so your cannulas how to collect a sample via venipuncture when you just need point of care testing and how to collect a sample via venipuncture when you need point of care and laboratory testing. Outside of that, you will find the recording of this in-service here as well uh, when we upload it after today. We've also included the information flyer that Ellie showed you at the start of the presentation. And we've also just included just some other useful um, resources that we think you might like. So the order of draw for collecting your lab specimens, some information on the blue um, citrate tube, and also you'll see in the video that we do use the BD Lua Lock access device. So we've also included a little information of use brochure for that one as well. And that's about it. So just to wrap up for this recorded session, uh, we do want to say a huge big thank you to Ellie um, and the BD team for their time in helping with the rollout of this syringe. If you do have any further questions for myself, for Ellie, you want some further training, anything like that, probably the best thing for you to do would be to reach out to your local coordinator and from there they will get in touch with Ellie and I and we'll get it all happening for you. So thank you, Ellie. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.